Welcome to What's Best Forum's Masters and Makers interview series. If you've not yet subscribed to the channel, please kindly do so. And if you like this video, please click like. Today we are meeting Jeff Fritz, brand ambassador at Magico on a very important day for Magico, the global debut of the M7 loudspeaker. Jeff, thank you for joining me today. Well, Ron, I really appreciate you having me and all the What's Best Forum uh, members. You know, I'm hoping that we can have a a really good talk about some big, big news for Magico. It's interesting that the M7 uses a slightly smaller mid-range, five inch rather than six inch. Is there a particular reason for this? The mid-range has to match the dispersion characteristics of the mid-base driver. So in the M7, the mid-base drivers are, are slightly smaller than in the M9. So it allowed Magico to go down to a five inch mid-range to match the dispersion capabilities or, or properties of that mid-base driver. It just it just gives coherence uh, between the mid-range handoff to the mid-base in a four-way loudspeaker. Why is the M7 cabinet, it looks a little bit less flared than the M9. Is there a particular reason for that difference in baffle? It's basically just creating uh, that aesthetic uh, that's going to be slightly different for each loudspeaker, primarily based on the driver complement. But then, you know, each, each loudspeaker is also going to have its own design flair and its own personality as well. So there's always going to be some slight differences, even, you know, within the M series, within the S series, within the A series. Uh, but a lot of that has to do with the driver size. I see the M7 sensitivity is nominally 92 dB. The M9 sensitivity nominally was 94. To what impedance does the uh, M7 dip at its lowest point? It is a nominally four ohm loudspeaker. Uh, that's the specification that we uh, that we provide. So it doesn't dip to two ohms or something at a particular frequency. I, I'm I'm not aware of uh, you know any any really significant dips. You know what I've been told you know by our engineering team is that it, it presents a nominal four ohm load. Why does Magico like 24 dB per octave crossovers? Doesn't that make for a potentially complex, potentially lossy crossover? I don't want to get you know too too out of my wheelhouse. Here, I'm not a loudspeaker engineer, but what I can tell you and what I am confident of is that, you know, in a, in a Magico loudspeaker, each, each driver is optimized, you know, as it should be for any loudspeaker for its, its frequency range. And so the, the goal with a steeper crossover certainly is to keep that driver operating in a range that it is really comfortable with the lowest distortion, the lowest breakup modes, so it, 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 it's, it's, you know, if you think about, if you think about it in terms of perhaps the number of parts or something like that, you know, you could even have no crossover and, and, you know, theoretically, right, that would be, you know, the signal could just pass right from the wire into the, into the driver, but that just wouldn't work, right? Because that driver is not designed to uh, reproduce uh, a, an input signal outside of its operating, outside of its pass fan. So when you have a steeper crossover, certainly you're able to optimize that driver for its intended purpose. Why did you forego in the M7 the bi-amplification of the M9? Well, the M9 is, is a different animal altogether. It, it is a more complicated, uh, complex, complicated loudspeaker, right? It's our flagship loudspeaker. It is, you know, it has an active bass section you know, with the MXO crossover. In the M7, it is a, you know, if you will, if you want to think about it like this, it is a scaled down M9. Uh, but in, in, the, in the interest of presenting an option to consumers that is a little bit simpler to set up, certainly you can have a more, you know, I don't want to say a simple system, that's probably a simplification, uh, an oversimplification, but you can have a system with less components, taking up less space, the system profile, if you will, that you could set up with an M7 is just going to be a little bit more palatable in some, in some environments than what you can do with the M9. Does the company recommend that M9 owners use the same amplifier on the 15 inch woofers as on the rest of the speaker? Or do you encourage experimentation? Has Magico ever experimented with a tube amplifier on top and solid state on the bottom? Not that I'm aware of. I, I'm not aware that we have a specific recommendation there. And certainly this is gonna be a place where, you know, the dealer uh, takes over and provides some, 
some options for the end user. Now, as an audiophile, I'm all about experimentation myself. One of the fun, fun parts actually of owning something like an M9, now certainly you've got to have an amplifier that's capable, right? You know, you, you know when you've got uh, these huge, you know, in a, in a stereo pair, four 15 inch woofers, you know, you're gonna have to have an amplifier that's capable uh, of, of, of controlling those, those large drivers. And you wanna have an amplifier that is powerful enough to really get the best out of a system like that that can just produce incredible SPLs, you know, even into the low frequencies. There certainly are lots of options. And that's where the fun part of, of setting up a system like that and being an audiophile in general really comes into play. What is Magico's philosophy or sonic objective in terms of what you're trying to achieve when you install a loudspeaker system in a client's home? That's a great question. And it's actually one of the things that drew me to Magico to begin with. And the, probably the easiest way to answer this, and it's going to, it's going to, Ron, it's going to sound a little bit cliche. I get That's that. That's okay. But it whatever really is the honest is, answer is the right answer. It, it really is strict neutrality. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, Magico sets out to design a loudspeaker, and this doesn't matter if it's an A series, an S series, an M series, even the M7, the goal is strict fidelity. So what Magico is attempting to do with, with some very high level engineering is taking all of the distortions, all of the things that could intrude on the music out of the loudspeaker performance. Now, certainly I, I, the, the gist of your question wasn't just um, you know, how does Magico design loudspeakers and what's the goal, but it's when we put that loudspeaker in a client's home. So I, I, I get that part and that's kind of part two. So part one is the loudspeaker has to be neutral. It has to be transparent to the source. What is the philosophy? What state are you trying to engender in the client when he or she sits down in front of those loudspeakers? Exactly what's on the recording. So if, if, if the loudspeaker imprints a sonic signature over the music, then, you know, that's really the designer of that loudspeaker interacting with that musician in a way that was never intended. So the loudspeaker has to be, it has to be a, an honest player, you know, in that equation. It's got to pass on whatever is on the recording. On the website, there's a lot of technical information, as you say, about the objective measurements of loudspeakers and about the use of the exotic materials to achieve very low distortion drivers. So is the Magico loudspeaker design philosophy to use these materials and to implement these techniques and technologies and whatever is the sound resulting from that design, that's the sound you're happy with? Well, it's not really so much the sound that you're happy with as much as the technical objective of these of these materials, Magico is really, can, you know, in my mind, and I've been working for the company for six months, so I've not been there for 20 years. But one of the things that I can tell you is that it's very much a research and development company. It, 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 it's, it's not simply, bam, spit out a design and start manufacturing it. These speakers are, the details are sweated over to an incredible degree. So when you take a material and you see a new material that's used or a new way that materials are used in a magic of loudspeaker, it's had to really, it's really had to pass muster in terms of the science. It has to show, there has to be um, objective measurements that are improved with the use or, 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 or a different use of a material. And when you take distortions out, when you create uh, parts, in this case, you're, you're talking about drivers that are better, that are more pistonic, you end up with a better result ultimately in the sonic presentation of that loudspeaker. So it's not, it's not a case where you're, 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 you're choosing a material and you listen to the material and you say, well, do I like the way that this, that this material sounds, right? That's, that's not the way that it's done. It's taking these materials really putting some engineering rigor behind them, finding out if their implementation can improve your objective. And then in, in the iterative process going forward, you know, you have prototypes and implementations in certain products. And if that, if that material or if that design turns out to be something that is objectively better, it, it, it's going to be subjectively better as well, as long as you're looking at all the parameters involved in that particular in that particular part in this case a driver
Do you and Alan and Yair have an opinion as to how important is mid-range driver surface area to transparency and realism? One of the things about the M7, it's got it's got a five inch mid-range that then hands off to these two nine inch mid-base drivers, right? So, you know, if you think about if you think about some of the large loudspeakers, and I've owned several of these types of loudspeakers where you've got these huge woofers, and these huge woofers hand off to maybe a six and a half inch mid-range. Those huge woofers can move a lot of air. That six and a half inch mid-range, there's gonna be a disparity, right? It's not gonna necessarily be able to keep up in the mid-base with those 15 inch woofers. So in a, in a product like the M7, which is a four-way loudspeaker, so it's a four-way six driver loudspeaker, you've got these big woofers handing off to these nine inch mid-base drivers that are doing the work this six and a half inch mid-range driver and another loudspeaker and maybe a, a two-way or a three-way may have to really, really work to keep up. These nine-inch mid-base drivers are providing that that umph. Right? And then when those nine-inch drivers hand off to that five-inch mid-range, that five-inch mid-range is right in its comfort zone. That is a huge advantage to a four-way loudspeaker. Now where the magic of loudspeaker is the M7 in particular is super, super capable is mid base to that mid range. You get these three drivers that really coalesce as one, right? And, and a lot of that is the crossover implementation in what is typically the mid band, right? In, which in, including the mid base in a three way loudspeaker in this four way M7, you're getting a five and two nines. That's a lot of surface area. And that really makes the loudspeaker come alive, particularly in the mid bass. But then you also just get this crystal clear mid range that this five inch driver is capable of. And then one other point there is you can't, you can't divorce the size of that mid range driver from what's happening with the tweeter, right? So that five inch mid range driver is also going to closely match the dispersion characteristics of the tweeter. And so you just get a very, very seamless, a very, very seamless, coherent sound. And, and with the M7, it's, it's really amazing that you have a speaker that's that large, right? It's 65 inches tall. And for all intents and purposes, it sounds like a single driver. Can you tell us what is the design philosophy in the M7 and the M9 underlying the preference for having both mid base drivers on top and both large woofers on the bottom, as opposed to having one large woofer on top, a mid base driver underneath that one, one large woofer on the bottom and a mid base driver on top of that one, a more symmetrical vertical array. What you're talking about is, is typically been, um, you know, described as a Diapolito type configuration. That's not a configuration uh, that Magico uses. One of the things that I can tell you that really governs driver placement, uh, probably more than just about anything, is tweeter height, right? It is, is making sure that tweet, the tweeter height is exactly what it needs to be, you know, for the average listening position. Sometimes that's going to dictate, right? And, 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 and with the size of base drivers, you know, on the bottom or whatever, it's going to it's gonna dictate perhaps even where the mid-range is placed. You know, you'll see uh, some loudspeakers where the mid-range is actually going to be uh, uh, over the tweeter. Sometimes it's going to be reversed. And a lot of that really depends on the driver size. And uh, But ultimately, it's going to be governed by the tweeter height. To your knowledge, has Magico ever experimented with field coil drivers? I'm not sure. That's a... Uh... Uh, that's a quite that would have to be a question for our engineering team. How does the M7 sound different to your ears than the M9? So I listened to the M9 back in uh, 2021, and I was actually a reviewer at that point, and I got a listening uh, session with the M9 that probably lasted about an hour. I was given a, a pretty wide variety of music, so I got a pretty good feel for the M9 at that point. With the M7, when I was back at the factory in August, it was a completely different experience. Alone got to the office, he fired up the system, he handed me the iPad and he left. And I basically had almost a day with the M7. And any, any music selection that I wanted, 
So I had probably, you know, five, six times the amount of time that I had with the M7 versus the M9. The listening experience actually in many ways is very, very similar in the sense that both speakers are incredibly capable in the bass. And listen, when we're talking about the M9, it, it's, it's a, the most capable speaker in the low frequencies that I've ever heard. The M7 is surprisingly close to the M9, but what the M9 can do in terms of the amount of air that it can move, it's almost unfathomable, honestly, unless you hear it. The M7, you basically to the same place. It certainly can't move as much air as an M9, but the basic experience that you get is very, 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 very similar. And I'm talking about in the bass, in the bass specifically. Focusing on the differences, admittedly only heard the M9 for one hour. Do you recall any difference in terms of transparency or resolution in the mid bass resulting from the different driver diameter configuration, the nines and the twelves in the M7 versus elevens and the fifteens in the M9? I honestly don't think that there's any difference in terms of uh, transparency and resolution. I think that the M9 and M7 are really cut from the same cloth. In terms of resolution and transparency, I think the M7 and M9 are both equally capable of just supreme transparency. The M9, honestly, it, it, it can just move a little bit more air. That's really the biggest difference. How do you go about helping a client decide whether to purchase an M7 or an M9? Would that mainly relate to the size of the listening room? Well, the first thing you got to look at is the budget right? Because the M9 is going to be twice as expensive, roughly, as the M7. But then the second thing that you've got is you've got some system complexity with the M9 that you've got to be willing uh, to, to undertake that you don't have with the M7. So, you know, we're going to have to have more space for components. We're going to have to have more in terms of channels of amplification. Then, as you said, the listening room. The M7 can go from a medium-sized room, I think, up to a very, very large room. It is completely capable of driving the largest rooms, right? So it's not necessarily from a from a sound perspective or from a, an SPL capability perspective, but it is it is a relevant question in terms of just the size of the loudspeaker, the physical size of the loudspeaker. You're going to need more space for an M9. M9s are just huge. They're taller. They weigh more. The logistics are going to be more difficult. Your floor is going to have to have to be capable of supporting that type of weight. I think the physical differences between the loudspeakers probably dictate more than actual the actual sound of the product because I think the M9 and the M7 certainly are both going to be capable of driving the largest rooms. Drawing on your 25 years of reviewing loudspeakers, to your ears, why do dynamic drivers in box speakers achieve a more convincing illusion of live music for you personally than planar dipoles or than horn loudspeakers? When I put a loudspeaker in a room, I just don't want to be reminded of deficiencies. I don't want to hear anything that is not on the recording. I don't want to have to Think about how loud I turn up the volume. I don't want to think about, you know, I, I really just want the loudspeaker to remove itself from the equation, right? And so the less, the less reminders that I have that I'm actually listening to a loudspeaker as opposed to just a musical performance, the better I am. And so, and, and, the, and the better the experience. So for me, that's just, you know, having, having, listen to, to products and loudspeakers for 25 years, going to shows all over the world. That just, I just come back to that, to that type of loudspeaker. How do you think the M7 sounds different compared to your recollections about the Q7 Mark II? I owned the Q7 for six years. So I owned the, uh, the original version and I owned the Mark II version. So when I went into the M7 listening session, I really kind of was pulling for the Q7, you know, in, in the sense of, is in many ways an updated Q7. It's not really, it's really a brand new product, but it is using the seven, you know, nomenclature uh, that would denote this type of product. The Q7 uh, was a four-way loudspeaker. The M7 is a four-way loudspeaker. You would expect some similarities, but I got to tell you, there's not really that many similarities. I mean, they're both fantastic loudspeakers, but the M7 
is just a whole different animal altogether. It's better in every way. And I think if someone were to listen to a Q7 and go and listen to an M7, it would be, it, it for me at least, right? Having been a Q7 owner, it was dramatically better in every fashion. Can you give us some insight into what differences you're actually hearing? What is it about the M7 that makes you feel a greater suspension of disbelief versus the Q7 Mark II? Well, I think one of the things is the capability in the mid-bass. I think that's probably one of the one of the primary things that I heard with the M7 that frankly, like I said before, I really hadn't heard from anything else. And that includes the Q7 Mark II. The, the M7 is so capable in the mid-bass. Now, if you do recall, the Q7 had one mid-bass driver. The M7 has two mid-bass drivers, right? It is incredibly capable in the mid-bass to the point where everything else sounds anemic in that frequency band, to be honest, uh, you know, save for the M9. I will point out one other thing that I think uh, separates those loudspeakers. With the M7, it's remarkable as you move off axis, tonally the speaker sounds the same. And that was something that was that was way different. Now certainly, you know, I'm not I'm not implying that the sound stage and the and the and the imaging is going to be the same. If you're standing right over next to a speaker, you're not going to get exactly the same stereo effect, right? But tonally that loudspeaker is virtually the same no matter where you are in the room, or at least where I was in the room on that particular day. And I, and I can tell you that's something, including the Q7 Mark II, uh, that I'd never heard from any other loudspeaker. Has Magico, to your knowledge, ever considered an explicitly four-tower system where the woofer towers are not optional subwoofers, but rather handle the low frequencies while a separate tower handles the mid-range and treble frequencies? Well, not a four-tower system per se. Is the S-series conscientiously engineered to be a little bit smoother sounding than the M-series? No, no, not at all. Both both speakers are designed to be completely neutral within their form factor and with the materials that those speakers are using. So, you know, if you look at the M series, the M, M series has, you know, all carbon fiber cabinetry. It's it's extremely expensive uh, to manufacture and to produce and to perfect the way that Magico has. The S series is using extruded and machined aluminum. You know, and there's all types of bracing and damping materials that uh, that go into that loudspeaker. And then the A series is also using um, uh, aluminum, um, you know, panel aluminum cabinets. And so, you know, each speaker is optimized for its form factor and for its price point, obviously. Uh, but the objective is the same. The objective is completely neutral sound, and really, it just comes down to you know, how much can you put into in terms of uh, the bill of materials to achieve that objective? And so that really kind of determines, you know, the ultimate performance. The M-Series is, is, is the top of the line. It's, it's, it's where Magico can put the most resources. But even, even the smallest speaker, the A1, it's not designed to be tonally different. It's just that it is a different form factor at a different price point. So the, the materials are going to be different. You know, what you're able to do is going to be different. What's going on in your research and development department? What's the next new project we should expect from Magico? Well, I can't tell you exactly that, Ron. I won't tell I anybody. Tell you, <laughs> but what I can tell you is there are things under development. That's kind of one of the exciting things about going to the factory and spending time you know, really seeing what's going on as you see uh, projects that, and you know, let's let's face it, some projects may not see the light of day. You know, I mean, sometimes you kind of have to go down that rabbit hole and see exactly what where it takes you and what a product might look like and what a product how it's going to perform. But I think Magico uh, people that that follow Magico and 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 even people that don't even know about Magico yet, I think are going to be very very impressed with some of the things that are coming and you know it's i i can tell you it's it's a very fruitful time in the magic o r d department uh in hayward california there's lots of cool stuff coming is magico developing a new horn driver or a new horn loudspeaker no not that i'm aware of jeff this has been wonderful congratulations on the launch of the new speaker thanks for joining me today 
Thanks, Ron. I really appreciate being here and uh, say hello to all the What's Best folks for me.